pretty whirlwind that I got the call to go to Thorkow. I'm pretty much packed and left three days later. Um, I never thought, I knew of pretty, like Rachel Brown Finnis, for instance, had played in Iceland, so I knew it was a good standard for the league, uh, which was the main thing for me. But, you know, the, the offer was there to, to sign a professional contract and, and to play in a foreign country and experience that and to be, you know, fed cakes that, like, you know, help roof over your head, all the little things that otherwise I'd have to think about and I'd have to sort out myself at home. Hello and welcome. I'm Ray Boggiano of University Campus of Football Business and its Global Institute of Sport. And we're joined today by one of our incredible students, Georgia Stevens. Georgia is exceptionally busy as she undertakes the final year of her multimedia sports journalism degree alongside a uh, life as a professional footballer and an accelerating media career. So to tell us all about it, welcome and thanks for joining us, Georgia. No problem, thanks for, thanks for having me. And so Georgia, we'll, we'll kick off with talking about your, uh, your, your role within uh, BT Sports Ultimate Goal, which starts on the 3rd of November and alongside 30 other female footballers from across Europe, you'll put through your paces at St. George's Park under the, the watchful eyes of, of former England internationals, Enia Luco and Rachel Brown Finnis. What can you tell us about the show and, and your experiences of it? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of closing in on the, the final sort of weeks now of kind of promo and things. It, comes out next Tuesday, um, half 10, BC Sport 3. Um, I'm watching Side TV as well for people who are in Europe. But yeah, it, it was just an, an opportunity that came up. I saw it on social media and um, thought I'd be a fool not to. Um, so I applied and I'm fortunate enough I received a call pretty pretty quickly after. Um, and I was quite happy with that because I was happy with my application. So I, I thought I should have. Um, and yeah, so I, I went to St George's Park with the um, for a period of time, and obviously during sort of like COVID and things, it, it was a lot more. I think it was more surreal because we went from zero interaction with anyone other than kind of your family members to suddenly, you know, because we were all tested and it was a very safe and um, strict environment that that we were in. You were suddenly surrounded by people that you could socialise with. You were playing pool together. Like, I think that was, that was probably one of the best things about the experience was the amount of people that we got to kind of spend time with and, and the friends we made from it. But yeah, we, we it was a great experience. There was thirty of us. We obviously, like you said, Rachel Brown Finnis, Enia Luco. We had Molly and Rosie Kamita, who are two you know ex pros now getting back into the game, who are involved in media. Um, and then we had masterclasses from the likes of, you know, Farrah Williams, Faye White in, in the women's game, but also Freddie Lundberg, uh, Jens Lehmann, Rio Ferdinand. Um, so that that experience and being able to kind of learn from those people and just have conversations with them was surreal. Um, I think I got the opportunity to speak to Peter Crouch on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And as a Liverpool fan, that was just crazy for me. I was kind of stood there for a while and every sort of question I'm asking, I'm thinking, you're asking Peter Crouch this. Like, you, 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 I grew up watching him. Um, but yeah, the experience was incredible. It was probably one of the most daunting and pressurised things I've ever done. But on the back of it, 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 it was life changing. I mean, if we said it's like two weeks of therapy. Like, you know, it, it was really... It was a really, really amazing experience. I uh, wanted to change it. And you've you've played at various levels as well for Liverpool, Everton, Fylde, Sheffield United. How did ultimate goal and the experience there compare to your, your time at those clubs? Yeah, so they, like you said, Liverpool and Everton were, were my academy years, I say, from you know, 10 till 16 between the two of them. Um, and then Fylde and Sheffield, United, Blackburn in there as well was more, you know, adult football, grown women football. Um, and I, I've been in those environments, even with England as well, where 
selection is constantly on your mind and I think England probably prepared me the best for that experience. I mean, it's at St George's Park, which I'm fortunate enough I've been there before. So little things like I knew my way around, I knew things that I need to pack and bring. And um, but I'd never been in an environment where it was on television as well. But the thing with England prepared me for it is like you're constantly under scrutiny. So you know how you how you speak to other people. You represent the badge at the end of the day when you're on SGP as an England player, and that sort of transferred over when you know the cameras are on. You, you don't have a minute to switch off or you know let your guard down or whatever. Like you have to make sure that you're constantly polite, well respectful, like little things like that. Um, so those experience kind of prepared me well for it. Um, and, and as a footballer, you're always getting scrutinised. You're always looking for selection and getting used to rejection and things like that. But I don't think anything will be able to prepare you to kind of be on like a reality TV show. Um, some of the emotions you go through. I, I mean, I'm not a very emotional person in public. And yeah, I think I probably cry more on camera than I ever have to some people, you know, in, in my day to day life. Because um, just the the pressure that you're under and the how much you want it and the kind of you know how exciting it is as well. There's there's so many emotions that go on in such a short period of time that although I felt like I was probably the most prepared there, I, it was still you know nothing could ever prepare you fully for for the full experience. Sounds incredible, a roller coaster, um, and and you've recently signed a professional contract at Icelandic club uh, Thor Cow and how how is that balance working out for you of, of uh, life as a professional footballer alongside your studies and all of the other commitments that you've got as well and how's Iceland treating you? Yeah so like you said uh, again it was pretty well win that I got the call to go to Thor Cow I'm pretty much packed and left three days later. Um, I never thought, I knew of pretty, like Rachel Brown Finnis, for instance, had played in Iceland. So I knew it was a good standard for the league, uh, which was the main thing for me. But, you know, the, the offer was there to, to sign a professional contract and, and to play in a foreign country and experience that and to be, you know, fair to case that, like, you know, help roof over your head, all the little things that. Otherwise, I'd have to think about and I'd have to sort out myself at home. I was now suddenly taken care of and, and, and that little bit of weight was off my shoulders. Um, on top of that, Iceland's just an incredibly beautiful country to be in. I mean, we've seen the Northern Lights twice now and that's something that some people may never see in their lifetime. So I, I'm incredibly lucky to be here and to, to be here because of football. Um, in terms of my studies, it, it's... I, I can't thank our lecturers enough for kind of the work they've done to help make sure that I'm okay. I'm keeping up to date with things on a personal level that I'm okay. That like, you know, it does, again, pressures, things like that. Um, so I can't thank the lecturers enough for that. It, it is difficult because obviously we're on kind of a, a rigorous training schedule and, and factoring in assignments. It, it's final year, so dissertation's a big thing as well. Um, but yeah, I, I've always had to juggle football and education um, from a young age, you know, even through certain GCSEs and A-levels. Um, I've, I've always been pretty committed in the way that I train and the way that I play and, and education always came first and it'll be no different while I'm over here. Um, it's just, you know, making sure that I factor in enough time for everything, which so far I'm, I'm doing okay. And another one of your commitments, you, you're one of Kick It Out's game changers as well, alongside 11 other future sports leaders. Um, what have you learned on that uh, programme and, and who have you managed to meet and learn from? Yeah, so the Game Changers programme was incredible. And again, I think we've come up to a year now. So we had our final seminar the, the other day, which was emotional for everyone um, because everyone's come so far in such a short space of time and I said the, the program, although it runs the way it runs, it's also kind of a lifelong network thing of we're constantly checking in, there's constantly opportunities um, and to just be involved in that's incredible. Um, 
like you said, 11 others are just a constant inspiration when you look at the people and what they're doing in their own fields and, and what they've overcome to do that. Um, learning wise, I, I spoke about it recently in, in an interview to, to do with ultimate goal of like, I've, I've always been a big advocate for like equality, inclusion, diversity, all that, because I play women's football at the end of the day. So most sort of hardships and slurs and discrimination I've probably come up against to do with women being involved in football from, from a young age. So that's always been something I've been passionate about, but to learn from other people about, you know, racism, homophobia, or all, all different aspects of discrimination, how it affects them personally, it, it just makes that kind of passion a bit more because you have a face to put to that now. So if I hear a racist slur or whatever, I'm, I'm thinking of my friend who I've just made there and I'm more likely to speak up about it. Um, and that's something the game changers have, have kind of instilled in all of us is although we all had our own little passions about it and we were very confident young people, by the end of it, we, we all had a voice that we were happy to be the only one in a crowd to, to stand up and speak out for someone. And, you know, I think if more people get involved in things like that, then the less likely it is that you're the only one there. Um, in terms of the seminars, we had one, I think my favourite one was probably with Faye Carithers, who's the broadcaster, um, just because some of the advice she gave us was just incredible in terms of working in the broadcast industry, you know, working as a woman in the broadcast industry. Um, and yeah, it, I think we had that seminar in the Premier League headquarters, which in itself was just a bit surreal, kind of sitting in the boardroom there and looking around and, and some of the people that work there, it, it was just incredible. And, and how important are initiatives like that for creating positive change across the, the wider sports industry, obviously from the perspective of, uh, of equality and inclusion and cohesion? Yeah, I mean, I think we saw it recently with the FA and their new initiative of, you know, making sure that more more um, environments are diverse. Um, but I'm a very firm believer if you can't see it, you can't be it. So although I'm very much comfortable and confident in kind of breaking through and, and maybe being the first to do something, you know, I'm, I'm the first in my family to, to go to university, hopefully graduate. I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, for other people, to, they don't have that kind of self-belief instilled in them, which is through no fault of their own. It's the environment that they're brought up in. Um, so if people are able, you know, through these initiatives to, to be role models, then, you know, it, it becomes less of an issue. It becomes less of an issue to see a black woman in a leadership role. It becomes less of an issue to see a gay man playing football. You know, the the more initiatives like these we have, the more diversity we have, the more role models we have, and then a less of a kind of a big deal that these things become because kids grow up and see that, you know, these people exist and these people can do the jobs that they want to do. You know, nobody ever thinks they can be something sometimes or it, it kind of dies out at an early age and you realise, oh, maybe I can't do that that maybe I can't do that I mean I grew up knowing that I wanted to be a footballer but because of the time women's football wasn't professional I kind of knew that I'd also have to have a second job which is why education was so massive for me whereas now young girls are growing up knowing that they can make a living playing football which is incredible so it works it's there so it, it's just applying it across the board now and, and showing the younger generation that you know no matter what you look like or you know who you love or or what you do you, you can kind of be anything that you want to be absolutely yeah the, the power of role models is is incredible and, and showing those paths are open to to everyone really so um on on your degree you're obviously studying multimedia sports journalism you've got a lot of experience now of, of talking on camera about football related subjects uh, particularly on youtube across various channels how, how has the degree helped to prepare you for that and, and build your confidence of, of speaking in front of a camera yeah I, i've always i've always been chatty as a, as a kid um but but in certain environments you know i was never the most confident i wasn't the one who'd stand in front of the class and do something that that was never me but i was always kind of quietly confident um 
so to be I always preferred I think being behind the camera for a lot of things and, and setting things up and make sure things look nice and it was actually when we did I, I got asked to be on Red Men um we met at the Northwest Football Awards and you know I was scout I, I loved Liverpool I was playing for Files at the time so it just made sense for them to reach out and, and branch out and for me to appear there so I did I loved it um, I kind of haven't stopped going on the show since, whether they want me to or not. Um, but that that helped me massively. But I was comfortable because I was talking about something I knew. I, I was talking about the Pro Football Club and I love the bones of that, that team. So I, I, I could talk about it all day and you forget the camera's on because you're talking to kind of your friends about it. Um, so then when we, when we were on the... We had an assignment, I think, a few months later. Um, and it was to do basically... A, a news style show and we had to produce it ourselves and it was like a bit that would fit into like ITV news we had to pitch it I was in a partnership and I was like okay so I'll do this from behind he's like what are you talking about I was like well I'm gonna film it you're gonna you've got a bit personal he's like you literally have been on YouTube like you can't pretend that you're not comfortable in front of a camera now I was like oh yeah I can't okay I guess this is the role that I've got to go into now I I've done it so it's no use kind of hiding it now, you just lean into it. Um, but yeah, definitely the, the two have gone hand in hand. So a lot of the stuff I've learned at Red Men in terms of confidence in front of the camera has translated into the kind of uni world, but then simple things like kind of, you know, media law and the way you ask certain questions and things have translated back over. And like you said, YouTube, I, I started a channel not long ago, um, kind of interviewing people about football magazines. It was just something I was interested in and I wanted to talk about. So I did it and I don't think I was being able to structure them interviews or know what should go into a, a show, a podcast, if I wouldn't have learned that from my assignment and, and from my, my degree and from my course. But at the same time, I wouldn't have had the confidence to deliver it if it wasn't for kind of rent men and the actual real life experience of, of doing those things so they go hand in hand and i think that's kind of it was the moment i was like oh maybe uni's right about like you know work experience practical like application and things yeah okay they're, they're onto something there and you, and you received the alistair campbell scholarship as well at, at ucfb did that help you with your studies and, and with finding work placements yeah, so I, I I applied for that. I think at the same time I, I I applied for uni, so I got in in first year and it spread across the three. Um, and obviously the the assistance is there in terms of kind of courses and things that maybe you don't have the finances to go on or that are open only to them. And and they you know say maybe you should go to this, maybe you should go to that. Um, we had a few lines up last year, but well early this year, but obviously because of kind of COVID and things, they kind of got scrapped. But the, the main thing they helped with was I applied for a work experience at Sky Sports News in London. Um, I think it was maybe end of my first year going into second, it was that summer. Um, and I just applied for it because I thought, you know, it's an amazing opportunity and if I get it, I get it and I'll, I'll figure I'm always the type of like, just apply and we'll figure out what happens if it, if it goes through. Um, and I got, I got accepted onto the programme. They gave me the dates and I, I figured it out so I didn't have football that week, like it was during the break. Um, but it was just the finances of living in London, um, supporting myself, having accommodation in London. Um, I spoke to the scholarship teams and they were amazing and basically provided me with enough kind of resources and things that I could live and stay in London, you know, without eating too much of my own bank balance. and. I got to spend two weeks working in Sky Sports News and, and from that I, I made an incredible, you know, it was an incredible experience. I got pieces of, of work published on the, the Sky Sports website. Um, I got to, you know, be around some sort of football legends as they're coming in and getting interviewed and real life experience of sitting in the gallery of what happens when something goes wrong of of little things that I've, I've never you never learn through a textbook you, you have to be there um and also from that in terms of you know I, I gained incredible um contact from that that I sp still speak to today and that have offered me jobs or work or things like that and, and none of that would be possible 
if it wasn't for kind of the scholarship team and, and giving me that support because at the end of the day, I wouldn't have been able to afford to, to do it and, and to be there. Um, so for that, I, I was incredibly grateful. That's great to hear. And, and you've touched on it already about your time with, with Redmen and you, you're a regular now alongside UCFB graduate Ross Chanley. Um, is that a bit of a dream come true, being able to, to do that role and how are you finding working with one of the country's biggest fan channels? Yeah, it's a it's a dream come true to work with Ross Chandley every other day. But um, <laughs> no, it's it, it's incredible. I I grew up once I grew up watching my men, but as I hit my kind of teens, and obviously before I, I knew who they were, I, I wasn't silly. Um, and it was the surreal moments of where I was on the show, and I'd have friends from kind of primary school and things who you know you still keep in touch over social media and that would message me and be like, have you just been on Redman? I swear that was like, I'm like, yeah, They're like that's crazy. Like, have you met Paul and Chris? I'm like, yeah, of course I've met Paul and Chris. Like, I, I see them every other, like, I know them. Um, So little things like that of, you forget sometimes who these people are in, in the eyes of other people. You know, they're, they're a fan channel. It's the same as we kind of look at Robbie from, from Arsenal Fans TV when he was there and, it's the exposure that that gives you of being on there is it's insane i mean they've got over quarter of a million subscribers i mean on twitter that almost i think they're over 500k now like the ridiculous numbers and, and that is the power kind of of the pool football club but also the power of like a well-produced like fan show and I, I mean there's still room for them to grow and improve and they're constantly striving for that but yeah to, to just be on that show and and to be around those guys is, is surreal. I mean, it's also inspiring because they literally started it in a living room with a camera and just chatting about Liverpool and now they're in their own little studio with a whole brand behind them, getting interviews with the likes of Jurgen Klopp. Um, so, you know, it's it's surreal constantly to be, to be around that. And I'm incredibly grateful to those guys because like I said, I don't think I'd have half the kind of confidence I do if I wouldn't have been on that show. I also don't think, you know, I'd I'd have half the kind of platform that I have if I wouldn't have had the exposure through them. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's surreal constantly. And like you said, it was actually Ross who reached out to me, um, probably through UCFB. Kind, of, I think it was because we were in the Northwest Awards and we we both been nominated. They'd done an article and, and that's how it all started. And yeah, I kind of I don't think they'll they'll get rid of me anytime soon. And Liverpool fans, along with um fans from across the Premier League, really have been uh, very vocal in the protest against the £14.95 pay-per-view, and in a really positive way to make donations to local food banks, obviously in Liverpool, but across the country as well. Um how it's very rare that fans unite on any subject really how powerful is that unified voice particularly in the in the circumstances that we're all in at the moment yeah i mean i know with the poor fans it was a, a great initiative started by the fan support and food banks who have been incredible throughout seasons gone since since they first started up you know of you come into the game bring something along with you drop them off they had drop off points you know outside goodison anfield um, and, and those sorts of initiatives are, are incredibly, they're just incredible because it is it's keeping in the touch of what football was and who football was for. It was for, you know, the working class. And, and the fact is, as it becomes this global game, it, it shifts away from that, which which sometimes is OK, because that, that's the way sport is and that's the way sport becomes. But at the same time, you know, you've, you've got to remember what city you're from, who the people are that you're surrounded by and, and you know, just because Liverpool Football Club are suddenly top of the league and this global superpower doesn't mean that, you know, there's still not working class people out there who, who can't afford to feed their family. Um, so I, I kind of knew that when Marcus Rashford started that initiative, I think it was Newcastle fans who, who started it first and said, you know, we're, we're boycotting the, the pay-per-view and we're, we're going to donate to that. I kind of thought, you know, fan support food banks are going are gonna to do that and... and and they did, and I mean, I think they raised over a hundred thousand pounds, which is just ridiculous numbers in in a weekend, and and that's a, a joint effort, like you said, Liverpool and Everton, which we we are, you know, rivals, we're bitter rivals, and 
I, I know that through family members of oh, Everton being top of the table grates me. But at the same time, you've seen it in history and you've seen in the past, like when there's causes that are there to be supported, like the, the city comes together. And and you saw that as well with the likes of Aston Villa and Leeds and, and places across the country all, all come together and donate. And um, I think it's that. It's it's the whole statement of fan support and food banks. If, you know, hunger doesn't wear club colours, it, it doesn't. It, it affects everyone. Um, I think in a time where everyone's being effective for people to reach into their own pockets and, and donate what they could is, is incredible because as hard off as someone is, there'll always be someone worse than you um, for people to, to be able to, that can afford it to do so is it, just amazing for, for everyone kind of involved. And yeah, I think hopefully we'll see over the next few days if pay-per-view still is a thing. Um, we've been pretty vocal about it on social media and through YouTube and things and my stance is very much that you know it's it's fifteen pounds for a one off payment on, on games that people won't be able to afford. Um I know Sheffield United fans had two games on the pay per view within the space of six days. That's thirty quid from a household that probably, you know, is is thinking of other places that they can put that thirty pounds towards. Um, so yeah, I, hopefully you know we see either a change into the pricing system or a pass or something like that introduced, or just a scrap of it completely. Because at the at the end of the day, you know, it, 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 the timing is incredibly wrong. We understand where it's coming from. You know, clubs are losing money through fans not being in the stadiums, but at the same time, you know, the, there's bigger things going on at the moment, and I think that the timing has been incredibly insensitive. Absolutely. And just finally, on your beloved Liverpool, then, what are your predictions for this season? Do you think um, they'll get number 20 without arguably, if not the best, one of the best players on the planet at the moment, Virgil van Dijk? I mean, it still hurts to think that, you know, he's, he's probably not going to be there for the season. Um, you know, Alisson's recoveries maybe give us a little bit of hope that he might be back before the end of the season, but... Yeah, it's, um, it was a huge blow for him to, to, to go out like that. Um, I'm going to be quietly optimistic because I think last season, if you would have asked me at this time if we'd win the league, I'd, I'd say, I don't know, like, we'll see what happens. I, I've never been, you know, I had hope because we finished second, but i never go straight out and say, yeah, we're going to win the league. Um, so the same sort of sentiment now of, I hope so, I wish, you know, if I could make sure one thing happens that would be it but at the same time I I, I know what what is going to be very competitive this year I think we've seen it already in the in the first few results that what's happened um, smaller clubs are stepping up bigger clubs are dropping points here and there um, it'll be an incredibly competitive season this year especially with, with no fans in the stadium and we travel to Europe and, and you know games getting postponed here and there in the future who knows um, but yeah, I'm optimistic. I, I'm optimistic. Uh, hopefully, hopefully number twenty is is brought home. Hopefully, Virgil's back to the, to be able to be on there to lift it. Fingers crossed, Georgie. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for your time and good luck with all of these projects that you've got.